Welcome to Align Through Time, where I take the time to look through your favourite franchises and work out how it all lines up. Persona is a spin-off of the larger Megami Tensei franchise and easily the most well-known corner of it. However, to explore the series timeline it needs to be separated from the rest because Mega Ten's larger multiverse is complicated and mostly theoretical like Zelda's was back in the day. I may cover Mega Ten one day but for now let's just talk Persona. The first Persona released in 1996 for the PlayStation. Rather than recruiting demons as is standard in Mega Ten, Persona has characters, usually high schoolers, summon entities that reflect their own inner selves. Based on the ages and birth dates of the cast, we know it takes place in its year of release. Both of the game's story routes, Sebek and Snow Queen, are considered canonical. Snow Queen takes place during the main story, before the group head to the Sebek building. Sadly, no version of the game allows this amalgamated version of the story to be played, because Atlas are huge cowards. I mean, they haven't even confirmed the American bastardization of the game to exist somewhere in the Mega Ten multiverse. Absolute cowards. Before we move into the game's sequel, we need to discuss its prequel, Shin Megami Tensei If, released two years prior on the Famicom. It served as an alternate take on the SMT series set in an alternate timeline where the apocalypse scene in SMT 1 didn't happen. It served as a spiritual predecessor for Persona with, most notably, the shift from apocalyptic settings to a high school. The significant note for this video is that the game's protagonist, Tamaki Uchida, makes an appearance in Persona 1 and 2 where she is canonised as female and serves as the love interest of the writer's self-insert. You know that's not a joke because I'm not that funny. No statement is made about which of If's endings is canonical, but we can probably rule out Charlie's route since the villain isn't dealt with there and he's certainly never going to return in Persona. Akira's route could explain why Tamaki changed schools though since she's listed as 16 in Persona. The party members are second years between 16 and 17 so she likely is too. It's probably a safe bet that If is set a year prior in 1995. It can't be set any earlier since she wouldn't have started high school by then. Persona 2 is where things get complicated. Yeah, that soon. P2 is split into two parts, Innocent Sin and Eternal Punishment. Innocent Sin follows a group of childhood friends who use their personas to fight Hitler in 1999, presumably in August to coincide with the real-life Grand Cross event from that month of that year, until one of them, Maya, is killed, fulfilling a prophecy that decimates the planet outside of their city. In order to undo this, the group agree to have their history changed so that they never were friends, creating a new timeline in which Eternal Punishment takes place in 2000. P1 still took place in this new timeline since some of its cast returned with their personas. The depressing part is that IS protagonist Tatsuya refused to forget what happened and returns to the old timeline once the world in this one is saved. So there is a universe where all your favourite Persona characters from all five games fucking died in the apocalypse and they will stay dead because that timeline still exists. Yay, wacky high school adventure! Persona 3 released in 2006 for the PS2 and served as a soft reboot with a new style and structure and no returning characters other than Igor. This game takes place from April 2009 to March 2010, obviously in the second timeline. I mean, there's no hard confirmation, but there are small hints and I feel that the creation of the new timeline in P2 would be redundant if the series didn't continue to use it. Granted, the fact that no one believes the supernatural shadow stuff after those prior incidents does call it into question somewhat, but still. The later release of P3 FES featured a new story called The Answer, which is generally not viewed favourably by the fans. It takes place on the 31st of March and 1st of April 2010. Persona 4 came in 2008, also for the PS2 despite being three years into a new console generation. 4 is where the series really picked up steam, haha, due to its overabundance of spin-off media. The game follows a new group of teens investigating a series of murders in a small town from April 2011 to March 2012. The later Vita port, Persona 4 Golden, added an epilogue set in unspecified time later, but definitely a good few months on. This is important to note, as most of the P4 spin-offs take place before then. Persona spin-off craze started with 2010's Persona 4 Arena, a fighting game by Arc System Works. This one takes place during Golden Week 2012, beginning with a plane hijacking on May 1st and user arrival on the 2nd, up through the 3rd, and ending on the morning of the 4th. What makes the game stand out is that it also features Aegis, Mitsuru, Akihiko and Fuka from P3, now two years older than they were in the answer, and it's fucking cool to see where they are after high school. Capitalising on the success of Arena, a sequel released in 2013, Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. This one takes place the day after the original on May 4th, one month before P4 day, and ends on the morning of the 6th. This time the other surviving P3 cast show up, and that right there was a problem. Two main characters of P3, including the main character, are dead for all intents and purposes. As such, any crossover featuring P3 with 
later cast can't use them without trampling on P3's impactful narrative. This has caused the subsequent spin-offs to rely on time travel and memory erasure to justify their plots, plucking the characters from the middle of their adventures and leaving them time-locked to their school life incarnations instead of continuing their lives into their 20s and beyond. And that's why 2014's Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth is fucking dumb. In order for P3 and Force protagonists to meet, the characters have to be pulled from their respective school festivals, September 09 and October 11 respectively. In 2015, Persona 4 Dancing All Night's release and, like the fighting games and dungeon crawler before it, it's canonical. Despite using designs closer to the main story of 4 for petty marketing reasons, this is still set about a month after the epilogue and I wish they'd incorporated those redesigns into their looks here. Finally, in 2016, Persona 5 was released and this one really shot the series into the mainstream. If you know about this series at all, you know all about this one. The story follows a group of teens who can alter people's hearts and make them feel guilty for the horrendous things they do and call themselves the Phantom Thieves of Hearts. The game is never explicit about its year, but matching up the dates and days of the in-game calendar proves it's set from April 2016 to March 2017. The game has since been replaced in the canon by Persona 5 Royal. Persona 5 was involved in two crossovers in 2018. First was Persona 5 Dancing in Starlight and Persona 3 Dancing in Moonlight, a duo released as separate games on the same day because fuck you, give me money. It's technically a crossover, even though the cast of the two games only have any interactions a couple of times off screen and we only hear about it second hand from Fuka and Futaba. The premise is that Elizabeth from 3 and the twins from 5 are arguing about whose guests would be better dancers after hearing about the previous dancing game from Margaret. So again, the cast are plucked from their own adventures so we can have both Makotos take part. Unlike Q, these games are never specific about their placement, so we have to go through small details to figure it out. One of 3D's social events has Ken refer to Shinji in the past tense, meaning he's already died by this point, setting this after the 4th of October. Additionally, Yukari calls Mitsuru her best friend, which Makoto is surprised by. They really only get that close on the 18th of November, so it seems to be after that as well. The group don't discuss the pending arrival of Nyx at any point, so I'd assume this takes place before Ryoji reveals that on the 3rd of December, nor do they mention the wounds Aegis received the night before. I almost narrowed it down further, but Ultimax decided Chidori should still be alive and fucked it all up. In 5D's opening scene, among other things, Joker can comment on Caroline and Justine being separated again and Morgana mentions that Joker's rehabilitation is over, meaning the twins have re-merged into Lavenza already and the group has beaten Yaldabaoth. No one seems surprised to see Joker or mentions him being in prison, so I'd guess he's been released by now as well, setting it after the 13th of February. In one of Haru's social events, Makoto mentions that she and Haru will be graduating from Shujin soon, which would happen on the 15th of March, so Joker's definitely not gone home yet. Elizabeth is not from the same time as the rest of the P3 cast. The debate between the sisters that kicks off the story has to take place after P4D, and one of Elizabeth's events heavily implies that she's aware of Makoto's fate. Another of her events has her suggest that she, the twins, and the two teams might not be from the same time, but the twins are aware of their true nature should Joker comment on it, so they're definitely from after the final battle as well. It differs from Q in that way, since Elizabeth and Theo were confirmed to be from the same time as the P3 cast though. And that's as close as I can get for now. The other game from 2018 was Persona Q2 New Cinema Labyrinth, which features the casts of P3, 4 and 5, once more brought from during their respective adventures. Additionally, the female protagonist from Persona 3 Portable is also present, having been brought from a parallel universe. I'll save the implications of that for later. It's hard to say with the P3 and 4 casts, but P5 is quite easy to place. Crow's presence means that the team is in the middle of the Psy arc, since Crow is only a member during that time. And it's mentioned a few times that they still have plenty of time before their deadline, so this is early on in the Psy arc. It's probably a safe bet it's in November though. When questioned, FemC claims it's 2009 currently. Naoto likewise claims it's 2011. The P4 cast is from late 2011, likely after Q1 took place, though the memory erasure means it could still be before. If we assume it's after, it's a very short time after since the P4 side of Q1 takes place on the 30th of October and Nanako, who appears in the epilogue of Q2, is kidnapped on the 5th of November and remains in the hospital until Christmas. It's probably safe to assume FemC is from the same time as the rest of the P3 cast, just not the same universe. This would then be after the 20th of September, but before Shinji's death on the 4th of October. After all, she doesn't indicate that her version of Shinji is dead. 
Now for the implications of Femc. Either version of P3's protagonist is born in 1992, four years prior to the first game. This means that the earliest branching point in the series, not counting Philemon's alteration in 2, is with the conception of this character, who is male in one universe and female in another. This means the whole timeline is doubled to represent her reality, and also means that there are two universes where the world gets fucked, and that's before you get into the numerous bad endings of later games that also have doubles in the opposite branch, plus the doubling of that through the re-releases, and no, we're not not getting into that. Instead, let's discuss Persona 5 Strikers, a Musou spin-off of P5 that spans from July 24th, a mere four months after Joker goes home, to August 31st. Some fans believe there is actually a split in the timeline, with Strikers following on from P5 Vanilla and not Royal. This is due to Strikers making no mention of the events of Royal since both were being developed at the same time, and the fact that some of the characters are supposed to have moved away not long after Royal, making them being able to get back together so soon seem unlikely. Honestly, I expect Atlas to just sweep this under the rug and say Royal and Strikers are both canon, similar to how Arena released before Golden and thus didn't have Marie in it, then she just shows up with little fanfare in Ultimax. See Atlas, this is why you should have made Royal's new story a separate game like I said. I've decided to move all the really obscure shit to the end here to make it easy to categorise. First, we'll discuss mobile and browser games. In 2006, a mobile spin-off of P1 was released titled Megami Ibunroku Persona Iku no Tohen, or Alternate Goddess Tale Persona, or the World Tower Chapter. It takes place towards the end of the Sebek building portion of the game, with the cast being sent into another dimension for a bit. In 2007, a pair of P2 tie-ins were released. Persona 2 Tsumi Lost Memories bridges the gap between IS and EP, with the IS cast having to defeat their shadows to accept the new reality, with Tatsuya failing to do so. Persona 2 Batsu Infinity Mask, according to a a really poorly written synopsis on the SMT wiki is set after EP and deals with the dead coming back to life which the EP cast have to put a stop to. P3 had an accompanying browser game, P3 The Night Before, which apparently had an original plot but it was discontinued a year and a half after launch and I can't find much about its plot so it's best to assume it's not canon, though everything technically is canon in the vast SMT multiverse. Persona 3M is set during the Yakushima trip and sees, haha, the group entering the Nightmare Hour and going up against copies of their personas that represent parts of themselves they need to accept, similar to Shadow Selves in P4. From what I can tell, it takes place across the nights of all four days of the trip, the 20th to the 23rd of July. Naturally, everyone forgets these events when they wake up. That makes what, four bonus adventures the P3 cast completely forgot about during the course of their game? There were a bunch of random puzzle games with no stories released as well, including an escape room type game based on the Love Hotel scene. The only other P3 mobile game of note is probably the least obscure one, I guess the first mission. Based on the length of the synopsis on the wiki, you'd think this thing was as long as a mainline game. It takes place in May 1999, a decade before the main game. A non-Persona mobile game of note is Shin Megami Tensei If Hazama's Chapter, which serves as a prequel to If, detailing its antagonist's rise to power. There were some random social games that sometimes had actual new characters, but have too little details about them to be worth adding. Now for other media. Persona Trinity Soul was an anime spin-off released before any anime adaptations taking place a decade after 3, with the only connections being cameos by Akihiko and Igor. It's not considered canon. There was a manga titled Persona Tsumi Tobatsu that served as a standalone spin-off of P2 along the same lines as Trinity Soul. I'm going to ignore that as well, along with the novel Persona X Detective Naoto, which was apparently removed from canon by Ultimax, though I've no idea how. Persona 4 The Magician is a manga detailing Yosuke Hanamura's move to Ina and continues up until he obtains his persona. There are also a few anthology manga and novels, but they're best left ignored. As for actual novels, Persona 2 Innocent Sin Novel details the events of IS from the perspective of Anna Yoshizaka. Persona 3 Shadow Cry, likewise, runs parallel to P3 and centres on Strega. Persona 3 Fragments of the End is set one month prior to the game and centres on Akihiko and the other upperclassmen helping one of their own senpai for their last month as second years. Persona 3 Portable Velvet Blue centres on the FEMC's relationships with the Velvet Room attendants during P3P, and I'm only mentioning it as an excuse to expand on FEMC's universe. Persona 4 Amnesia of Fog follows Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko shortly after Yukiko joins the team as they investigate what appears to be Saki Konishi in the TV world. If also had a tie-in novel, SMT If Jin of the Expanse, which is part of the Jin trilogy about an OC being part of SMT 1, 2, and If in various lives or something. Honestly, it's hard to say if it is supposed to be canon 
and so I'm just gonna leave it off for now. Maybe I'll know more by the time I cover Mainline or Return to Persona. I mean, with how often this series pumps out spin-offs, it's probably not gonna be long until then. There have also been a ton of drama CDs based on the series. Persona 2 Innocent Sin, The Errors of Their Youth apparently has a prologue to Eternal Punishment and a bunch of parodies and remixes. Persona 3 had approximately 800,000 drama CDs and 4 has quite a few. Some are sets of short stories and generally speaking, not much is documented about them, so I'm not going to bother. Given the franchise's popularity and with the rising popularity of audiobooks, you'd think there'd be a company out there willing to make dub versions with the game casts. Alas. And that's the full Persona timeline, drama CDs excluded. Um, excuse me? What about Devil Summoner? <sighs> oh, hey, Maka of the YouTube channel Maka. You're telling me this isn't over yet? Nope. Devil Summoner series is part of the Persona canon, and I thought you should know that before you get swamped with comments calling you stupid for not knowing that. I appreciate the heads up, but I just can't be arsed dealing with this right now. Don't worry, you go to bed, I'll take over. You can you can go and get some sleepy. Go by goodbye. This is my video now. In Persona 2, washed up detective Daisuke Todoroki is possessed by the spirit of Kyoji Kuzunoha from Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner and Devil Summoner Soul Hackers. To not get too into this, since this video is more than long enough, Devil Summoner takes place in the year 1990X. We'll say after if, since it released a year after if. While Soul Hackers released a year after Persona 1, so we'll place that there. Put Namissa in the arena games, cowards. Do anything with Namissa. Next, we have probably the most well-known part of the Devil Summoner series, the Raido duology. Raido Kuzunoha vs. the Soulless Army, and Raido Kuzunoha vs. King Abaddon both take place in the 1930s, centering on Raido Kuzunoha the 14th. Now, you might be going, Whoa, GA talks about Raido as if he's a fictional character in P4, and like, yeah, but that was only in the English dub. The Japanese version instead made reference to the Kendaichi Case Files, a popular mystery manga from the real world. The localizers presumably changed the reference for familiarity's sake. In fact, the anime dub actually kept the original reference. Wow! You're like living the life of Kendaichi! Of course, if the Kuzunoha lineage is famous enough, there could be movies based on them in the setting. Maybe the live-action Devil Summoner TV series exists in the Persona universe as like a historical piece or something. Now, those aren't the only Devil Summoner games. A mobile game, Devil Summoner Soul Hackers Intruders, released in 2007, taking place six months after the original. Devil Summoner Zero is an unfinished manga prequel to Devil Summoner, focused on Rei and Kyoji's early days working together. Later on, Raido would receive a manga tie-in that was completed in the form of Devil Summoner Raido Kuzunoha vs. the Lone Marabito, which takes place after King Abaddon. Then, 2009 saw a drama CD release under the name Devil Summoner Kuzunoha Raido Tai Sekiganki Shin. This one also follows King Abaddon, but there's too little information about it and the manga to say for certain. So, since the SMT wiki references the act of rebuilding the capital after King Abaddon in the drama CD summary, we'll assume it takes place first. And finally, we have some novel tie-ins. Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Sealed Soul has very little written about it, but it seems to feature both the protagonist and Rei Reiho from the original game, so we'll place it not long after that. Devil Summoner Kuzunoha Raido Tai Shibito Ekishi is a prequel about Raido's arrival in the capital before Soulless Army. It also features Kyoji Kuzunoha the first. And the most unique of these novels is Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner side story Laments of a Requiem, which takes place in ancient Japan and centers on the backstory of Inaruna from the original game and her mother, Queen Anne. Lady on. And that's about it for Devil Summoner. You know, other than Soul Hacker's Dead City, which doesn't even have a page on the SMT wiki, which should give you an idea of how irrelevant it probably is. We could talk about Raido's appearance in Nocturne or how If splits off from mainline SMT, but we've covered more than enough already, so we'll save that for another time. I guarantee there's some obscure side game that references Persona that people are going to go on about in the comments anyway. I'm not going to go in depth on the story of each installment because it's always been my least favorite segment of this show, and I think I'll have more drive to make more of these if I leave those out in future. If you want something more in depth on the stories, then check out Snickety Slice's Ultimate Persona Compendium, which has gone very in depth on Persona 1 and the Tuology. As for me, I need to get back to non-themed content for the first time in two months because I am a dumb. I'd like to thank Maka for his help piecing together the Devil Summoner part of this timeline and pointing out the Persona 2 connection that had completely slipped my mind. 
generic, no problem man, type response with a plug for your channel. Um, what? Yes, of course, and make sure to follow me over at Maka on YouTube, and JBO Maka on Twitter, and JBO Maka on Twitch, and JBO Maka on basically everything that's not YouTube. Please subscribe to me, I'm almost at 10k. Actually, before you go, there is one other thing I'd like your help with. What's up? What do you need? Well, I'm about to go fight Lucifer to convince him to let me help him beat up God for his lunch money, and I need a very particular set of skills if I'm gonna do that, so... Well, that son of a bitch has had it coming. I'll help you with that. Thank you. Okay, how much do your services cost? You get the special discount price of one maca. There you go. Wait, what? Thank you very much. Starting today, I work for you. Oh, hell yeah. God's lunch money is mine. Oh my god, it's Dante! <laughs>